Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. I'm real excited about tonight's guest. Actually, Ralph was on my show uh, right after he wrote an article for Vanity Fair. Uh, Ralph Blumenthal, I should say, is our guest, and uh, he was on the show shortly after he wrote an article in Vanity Fair about John Mack, and uh, his interest grew, and uh, he's written a wonderful book. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about that tonight. I have the, I was lucky enough to get the book in the mail, and uh, I it's one of those, uh, I've been terribly busy, and uh, it's one of these books that once I started, I, I can't put it down. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And the ironic part of, uh, of John Mack in this situation is I've been now for about a month and a half, I've been at a location in Wellesley, Massachusetts, um, working, putting together an auction for a really fine gentleman, a retired um, psychiatrist, a Harvard faculty member, and also a close friend of John Mack's. And uh, uh, so we get into conversations quite a bit about John Mack, and he also, this uh, Harvard professor I'm working with, Dr. Robert Piles, I can say his name, um, he uh, used to be in the Navy, and he admitted to me the other night that uh, he remembers being on the aircraft carrier and uh, pilots coming in and telling them, uh, telling him that they saw all these weird things happening in the sky. He says, so he goes, I believe something's going on. But one of the things uh, he said is they really mistreated John Mack, and he it really, upset him how he was treated uh, because of what John did. And we're going to be talking about that. And uh, what John did was uh, he looked into the abduction phenomenon. And uh, so someone, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner, he had all these things going for him, a stellar reputation. Um, but he was open-minded enough to look at something that was bewilder uh, bewildering. Um, and uh, Anyway, I hope you get a chance to read the book. We have Ralph coming on in just a second. I do want to thank everyone that helps out with the show. Um, I, pre I appreciate that very much. Anyone can help out financially for a few dollars a month or more. All that information's on our website. Uh, speaking of that, over at podcastufo.com, the blog this week is uh, uh, Charles Lear, who does the blogs every week. He's taken a little bit of a break. Uh, he is finishing up on his book, which uh, is going to go off to the publishers fairly soon. Um, so I'm really excited for him. So I brought up an old blog of the Father Gill case, um, which I think is one of the most fascinating cases. Uh, and uh, it happened, I think, in 1952. I don't want to get that wrong. But um, anyway, check out the blog over there. The Father Gill case is very interesting. We will have an audio blog of it up if you're lazy like I am some of the time you want to listen to it instead. Those audio blogs go out on our website and uh, on uh, the uh, podcast feed and on YouTube, usually on Fridays, Friday or Saturday, something like that. So you can look forward to that every week. And I think that's enough for me. I'm ready to bring in our guest. Uh, welcome to the show, Ralph. Thank you, Martin. A real pleasure. Yes, yes. I remember, how long ago did you write that article for Vanity Fair? I think that was uh, 2013. Uh, I'd been looking into John Mack for about then already uh, eight or nine years. Uh, so um, altogether, it's been about 16 years that I've been on this. It uh, seems like forever. Really? But um, the Vanity Fair piece was kind of a milestone for me because I was able to write about what I knew and I learned a lot more since then. Speaking of uh, you, the parallels I'm thinking of, I, I, I'd like to know uh, the parallels between you and John Mack in a way that, you know, he was a re Harvard, a respected um, Harvard uh, professor and a child psychiatrist um, had uh, a Pulitzer Prize for his book on um, uh, Lawrence, of Arla uh, Lawrence of Arabia, right? Is that right, where he right, right. got his book? Yep. Yeah. Um, um, so anyway... How have you fared? Uh, because you you are instrumental in the New York Times article, December um, 16th, 19, uh, 2019, 2017, mm -hmm. that kind of shook everything up. I mean, you're one yeah. of the three authors of that. Uh, how have you fared taking a trip down the road of UFOs? Well, first of all, I'm flattered that you mentioned me in the same uh, sentence with John Mack in terms of similarities, because he was much better looking than I am. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he was indeed uh, good looking. Yeah. Uh, very tall, you know, uh, commandingly tall with bright blue eyes. 
Um, and actually, that's a later picture of him in his earlier years. He was even more uh, he was very magnetic. Uh, yeah. And he was magnetic yeah. to men and women, but particularly to women, um, as we'll find out. But um, so, uh, you know, I don't compare myself to him in terms of certainly of his achievements. He was a towering intellectual. Um, he had won a Pulitzer Prize in, for his uh, biography of uh, T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, and he was a real pillar of the Harvard establishment. He had written books on nightmares. He had written books on childhood development. So, um, uh, and I've written for the New York Times. But um, anyway, uh, we're similar in that um, his quest to discover what was going on with these stories of alien abduction uh, gripped him. Uh, to the point where he risked his career to, to follow that. And um, learning about him gripped me. Uh, I didn't risk my career, I'm happy to say, um, but I was uh, really, uh, I don't want to say obsessed, maybe that's too strong a word, but certainly captured, uh, not by aliens, but by the phenomenon that, that, that attracted him. Um, and when I came to write those, uh, co-write those stories in the New York Times about uh, uh, the secret Pentagon unit investigating UFOs, um, we think we did move the needle. Uh, it, it was the first time really a mainstream publication seemed to take the phenomenon seriously. The first time anyone knew about this secret UFO unit, uh, it was just called ATIP. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of the role we had in that. Yeah. Um did you know for a while that that was going to be, um, you know, front page news and such a, you know, change things the way it did? Or was it just no, caught you by surprise? No. It caught me by surprise. I mean, I've been working on the John Mack book, which is very different because that was his story about his involvement with, uh, you know, the alien abduction phenomenon. I always want to call it phenomenon because I don't want to say it's real to the point of uh, happening in our everyday reality. John grappled with that. It, it's a phenomenon. I mean, there's strange things about it. John took it as, as, as something real. And in a way, it's real. It's certainly real to the people who go through it. But the ultimate reality of it is, is obviously still a, a mystery. Um, but um, uh, I lost my train of thought there. But um, uh, well, I was asking you if, you if you had any ridicule from Oh, you know, uh, long parallel to what what he had. Yeah, you know. uh, <laughs> uh, we did from colleagues. Um, uh, we did get some ridicule because anybody who touches a subject still uh, subjects uh, themselves to ridicule, unfortunately. Um, and John, uh, you know, put up with a great deal of that, uh, as you you know uh, noted at one point uh, uh, at Harvard. Uh, you know, put him under, uh, I call it an inquisition. It was a word that they used. <laughs> um, they yeah. said, John, this is not an inquisition. So he was wondering, well, why did they say what it was not? <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think so, I just read that. I think I just read that uh, paragraph uh, earlier today. Yeah. The so, inquisition thing. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he suffered a lot worse than, than I did. And uh, when we came in with the story, you, I, I, here was the question. You asked whether it caught me by surprise. And uh, Leslie, Leslie Kane, my uh, co-writer with Helene Cooper, Leslie went down to Washington and found out that there had been a meeting of high-level people, including Lou Elizondo, who was the head of this uh, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification System, the secret Pentagon unit, which no one knew about, uh, that was investigating UFOs. So she attended the meeting as a you know, known writer on UFOs, and found out that Lou was quitting because he wasn't getting enough support from the government, uh, from the Pentagon. So that was a good story right there. And in the course yeah. of that, we could tell, you know, what what this unit uh, was, how it had been funded by, you know, by Harry Reid, Senate Majority Leader for $22 million, what it accomplished. And we put out those Navy videos that continue to be among the most watched, uh, you know, videos the Times has ever put out, which show... Uh, Navy jets, you know, scrambling around these uh, these objects, these lights that uh, are were picked up by radar. They were caught on camera, so they are real. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, uh, Lou's going to be on the show just to announce that uh, Lou Elizondo will be coming oh. up uh, uh, in May at some point. So, yeah, I, there's so much more to talk to him about now that he's uh, free from. Um, to the Stars Academy, he right, can talk more right. freely about things. So uh, it should be interesting. But um, 
so when when that all happened, um, I, I think I saw that there was something like 120 news reports in a few days out on that when yeah. that came out. That, that and were really, you getting requests yeah. to be interviewed yourself as well? Oh, yeah. Time? Oh, yeah. We were on uh, all the media. Um, Fox News, by the way, has been particularly aggressive on the uh, UFO front. Uh, yeah. I don't know, understand quite why, uh, but um, uh, they are very interested. They recently had a, you know some good interviews with John Rat Ratcliffe of uh, the, I saw that. Uh, yep. the di director of uh, national intelligence and, uh, and Marco Rubio, uh, the ranking chair of the in Senate Intelligence Committee. So uh, Fox has been very aggressive, but we were on all the stations and written up in the media and, uh, because you know it did change the paradigm. Uh, I mean, I think it, it made it safe for mainstream media to wade into this uh, subject that was long ridiculed. Yeah, and I wanna personally thank you because it's made my life easier. I've talked about it a number of times on the show where I, uh, because I'm a fine arts appraiser, I, I'm really careful. Um, hang on just a second. Um, I don't know what, okay, sorry about that. Um, so it really uh, has changed my, um, let's see, I, I've been really reluctant to talk about UFOs, you know, when it comes to my profession. And since that article came out, I, I don't have that fear any longer. It's, um, I have, uh, like, for instance, I talked about earlier where I brought it up with, um, uh, you know, the person I'm working with, the Harvard professor that I'm working with now, right. I would have never been able to do that before. So thank you for making it easier. <laughs> well, I, think I appreciate the, the word, it. It's opening up widely and uh, maybe not as fast as some people want, you know, immediate disclosure of everything the government knows, but step by step, we're, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. Now, I, I do want to tell you, I get a lot of people that are just starting to come into the UFO uh, world and, and looking <clears throat> at things, and they, they may have absolutely no idea who any of us are, for one thing, but... <laughs> Also, uh, John Mack. So um, even though we're going to be talking about your book and John Mack, the man, and, and what he went through and everything, I would like, if you could, in a nutshell, to explain to the person that really had never heard much about John Mack, if you can. Uh, um, sure. Um, because, you know, frankly, uh, Martin, I didn't know who John Mack was when I stumbled across him. Uh, um, I'll, I'll tell the story quickly. I was a, a New York Times correspondent in Texas. Uh, and I picked up a used book uh, one day, and it was John Mack's second book, Passport to the Cosmos. Mm. Um, and I was amazed that he was an esteemed Harvard professor, you know, psychiatry, uh, with a Pulitzer Prize for a Lawrence of Arabia uh, biography, um, uh, and very respected in the community. And, and here he was, uh, you know, researching a, a human encounters uh, with aliens or what people remembered as these encounters. So I thought, well, that's interesting right there. So uh, I thought, gee, I ought to give him a call. Uh, maybe I'll make a, you know, do a story, do an interview. Um, and uh, I was naive because I'd never heard of him. He'd been, he was very uh, famous already. Uh, he'd been on Oprah. He'd written, this was the second book I saw. He'd written a book before that. Uh, he'd been all over the media, including in the New York Times, but I had just missed it. So, um, uh, a few days later, I pick up the paper and he's dead. Uh, he was run down in London, looking the wrong way down a London street, which Americans do too often. Yeah. Uh, and a guy who had too much to drink hit him and killed him. And it wasn't a conspiracy. It was not an assassination as, you know, a lot of the yeah. stories went. Anyway, so um, I then decided to look into John Mack and I got access to his papers from his family and his archives and his journals and everything he did, he, he made a copy of and made a tape of. So anyway, he was a Harvard professor who was very active in social causes, first of all, in his career. He helped found services for the poor in Cambridge, mental health clinics. Um, uh, then he did this Pulitzer Prize winning biography of Lawrence of Arabia, and that made him an expert on the Middle East. So he traveled all over the Middle East trying to make peace between the Israelis and the uh, Palestinians. He actually met with Yasser Arafat at one point. Um, and then he became an anti-nuclear weapons activist. He protested nuclear weapons in, Mon in uh, Nevada, got arrested with his family. Um, and then, uh, 
that came a turning point. He went out to Esalen, you know, that great think tank on the Pacific, that psychic think tank, uh, oh, yeah. very avant-garde, uh, a lot of, you know, experiments with, you know, mind altering, uh, you know, uh, processes, etc., including drugs. Um, anyway, he went out there and got interested in holotropic breathing, a way of elevating, uh, of altering your consciousness through breathing instead of drugs. Um, and uh, that put him on another spiritual level. He suddenly became aware of another world. Um, and, um, and then he met Bud Hopkins, who uh, many of the li listeners may know the name at least, uh, who was a uh, early abduction researcher before John Mack. And he got John Mack involved in abduction research. And that's, you know, the, that's the quick story about who John Mack was. Uh, he ca came from a very um, unlikely UFO family, family professors, and they weren't interested in spiritual, uh, you know, fantasy and things like that. They were very well grounded. So um, his his spiritual awakening was 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 rather momentous. Very good. Thank you for that. Now I know somewhere in your book you mentioned how he first. Um, <clears throat> got in contact with Bud Hopkins. Wasn't it someone he was speaking to that knew him or something? There was, yeah, or they had, yeah. How did that go? Well, he, as I said, uh, uh, John Mack was out at Esalen uh, doing this holotropic breathing. And um, oh, oh. one of the people uh, he was, uh, Sorry. Uh, one of the people he was in a group with, with a fellow psychiatrist, um, well, actually, uh, it, it happened even before that. Uh, Stan Groff, the uh, Czech-born psychiatrist who developed holotropic breathing um, and who did a lot of research with LSD, a real pioneer himself, um, gave John Mack a chapter of a book that, that he, uh, Stan Groff, was editing called Spiritual Emergency. And the book had a chapter about uh, the alien phenomenon, and what it meant, and what it, what it, and why it was a mystery because it couldn't, it couldn't be solved. And um, and and John read that. He said, "Why is Stan Groff giving me this book? I mean, I, this makes no sense to me." And he, you know, is it true? I mean, he he was mystified. And then he met a fellow psychiatrist who said she knew Bud Hopkins, who was doing all this research with abductees or experiencers, as they like to call them. And would John Mack like to meet Bud Hopkins? And his first reaction was, no, I think he's, he, these people got to be crazy. And so and anyway, the works has got to be crazy. So John Mack was, um, you know, a skeptic from the beginning. Um, but uh, I can elaborate on the story later if you want. But one thing led to another, and he found himself meeting with Bud Hopkins. It was one of those moments of, you know, uh, synchronicity that, that changed one's life. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm out on the Cape, Cape Cod, and if I remember right, um, Bud and both uh, John Mack had places. I think Truro was uh, one of the locations. Well, not John, but uh, Robert Lifton, a fellow psychiatrist. Lifton oh, was okay. prominent in his own right. I mean, Lifton had written that wonderful book on uh, Nazi doctors and you know uh, how they came to become you know killers, uh, working against health instead of for health, uh, you know, participating in genocide. So Lifton had done that, and he'd written a book on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and he was a friend of John's. So, and and because Lifton was a psychiatrist, he spent every summer on the Cape, which is why you can't get analyzed in the summer, because all yeah. you know, all the psychiatrists are on Cape Cod in yeah, August. That's funny. So yeah. you know, don't don't have a mental health crisis in August. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll keep that so, in mind. <laughs> if you can, if you can, if you can, you know, control it that way. So. Yeah. Um, so John Mack is visiting Lifton in New York, and, and Lifton, uh, John Mack finds out, knows Bud Hopkins from Cape Cod. Now, Bud Hopkins was an artist who had spotted a UFO in the 1960s and got interested in, in UFOs and aliens and all that. So uh, John mentioned that he had gotten an invitation to, to call Bud, but he didn't want to call Bud Hopkins because he thought the whole thing was nonsense. And then he said to Lifton, oh, by the way, you know Bud Hopkins. Why don't you come with me? And we'll both visit him. And uh, this is a story I tell in the book. At, at, at this point, uh, Lifton's wife, BJ, uh, speaks up in a very spooky um, uh, interruption. And she says to her husband, no, 
Uh, she says, you have a choice about getting involved in this, and John doesn't. Right. Wow. When I heard that story, it blew me away because she was like a Cassandra. I mean, she saw the whole thing, how John was going to get sucked into this thing, and and, and her husband didn't need to. Wow. So, um, yeah. and sure enough, John just suddenly, it popped into his mind, he's going to visit Bud Hopkins, even after he said, uh, no, that's crazy. I, you know, I, I don't believe in it. It's... Um, but he, he visited Bud Hopkins and Bud showed him the letters that he, Bud had gotten from these experiences, you know, uh, relating the most extraordinary encounters with, you know, these alien beings and being taken up on a ship and subject to reproductive experiments and, uh, you know, fathering and mothering hybrid children and, you know, stuff that John and everyone else would, knows it can't possibly be true. And yet the accounts were so convincing um, after John, you know, collected his own circle of people to investigate. He, 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 he was gripped. He wanted to get to the bottom of it. So he started investigating himself. So that's the short version of the story, how John got into it through Bud Hopkins. Are you aware of, was there a certain case that kind of pushed John like over the edge and, and really looking into this thing seriously? Well, you know, there were so many, Martin, and uh, each one, what was interesting to John was that the stories were basically coherent, that they all seemed to follow a similar narrative, but they were mm -hmm. all different in, in detail. So it was not like the people were following a script, you know, and it was not like they even uh, were eager to come forward and tell their stories to John. He had to persuade them. They were uh, afraid. They were. They thought they were going crazy. You know, they couldn't believe themselves what had happened to them or what they remembered happening to them, which they often remembered consciously uh, quite apart from hypnosis. They had fragments of these memories and they knew it was not a nightmare and they knew it was not, um, you know, something that, that was made up. They, they say, I know what, what happened. I know reality. Anyway, um, so, I mean, among the cases he, he talked about early on was one of um, two girls um, he, and he met with one of them, two girls who were uh, uh, having a sleepover when they were kids. Um, and during the night, they spotted a UFO um, outside the window. And during the night, one of the, the mothers of the, the girls hosting the sleepover came down to check on the girls and the girls were, were gone. Hmm. And the mother absolutely panicked. You know, she was responsible for the two girls, you know, the, uh, the sleepover and she called the police and they searched and they didn't find the girls. And a few hours later, they turned up back in their beds. And uh, the girl who John Mack had interviewed uh, later said, well, in that time she had an abduction experience. She remembered being taken onto a ship and had all these, you know, experiences. So that was a intriguing case because it was one of the few cases where John found um, um, an actual physical absence um, and th those cases didn't come up that often, but whenever you have any kind of witness corroboration like that, um, uh, it becomes more compelling. So that was one case. Um, and, uh, you know, he had, as I said, one case is more astounding than another. Um, and he compiled them into a book, his first book, uh, called, uh, abduction, human encounters with aliens, the 13 case studies. And, um, uh, Boy, anyone who's interested in this field has to read that book because uh, he goes about it like a psychiatrist. He delves into the cases. He cross-examines them. And um, there's doesn't come away with any good explanation. That's right. That's right. He also um, gets to meet. There is a really interesting case, and I'm sure you know about this. It's in the book, of course, um, about the Brooklyn Bridge with a woman like floats out and there was someone that yeah. witnessed this on the outside too, that came about later. That's quite yeah. a story. Do you know that the details that's a, of this? Story? Yeah, that's that uh, looked like it was going to be the most important case, maybe other than the Betty and Barney Hill case of 1961, which came out later, which was, you know, the interrupted journey, um, which is kind of the, the mother load of abduction stories. Uh, well, this case you just met, mentioned Martin, uh, looked like it was going to be as good as that. Uh, Bud Hopkins came across it 
um, when uh, uh, he got a letter from two guys who said they were uh, police, they were actually security guards apparently, who were escorting a VIP um, to a meeting late at night uh, along the down the East River, down the FDR Drive in New York, and they saw uh, a woman being levitated out of her 11th story window over the Brooklyn Bridge into a uh, into a UFO by three alien beings floating next to her. And then they watched the UFO take off with the woman and plunge into the East River. That's this it. was the story. Yes. This was the yes. story that, that came to, uh, to Bud Hopkins and that he shared with John Mack. So um, Bud spent a lot of time trying to identify these two witnesses. And the, the sad story is that despite the fact that he, they, they eventually sent him tapes, that he had uh, transcripts of, uh, you know, the, the letters from them and tapes, uh, he could never identify them. He never found them. Uh, they were very elusive. And um, uh, so it became one of those uh, super mysteries that uh, other people supposedly witnessed this from the Brooklyn Bridge. Drivers on the bridge uh, later came forward and said they had seen simil something similar. But the case had, as I said, one big hole in it, which was that the two people who came forward first and, and, and told the whole story, who were apparently abducted along with the woman at some point, it got very convoluted, uh, were never identified. Wow. Yeah. Um, there was... A rumor, and I don't know if it's true, that there was someone uh, like an ambassador or something in a car that was actually one of the witnesses. I don't know if you ever heard that part of it. Yeah, no, no, that's in the book. <laughs> the, the, oh, supposedly. it is? Supposedly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Um, I must have skimmed so, over that. I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> it, it, you could be forgiven for that because it is so strange. Martin, if I tell you some of the stories that came up, uh, I mean, each story is like better than the last one. So supposedly the VIP who these two security guards were escorting uh, turned out to be uh, Javier Perez de Cuellar, the Secretary General of the United Nations. That's and of course, yeah. okay. people made an effort later, including me, to uh, confront Perez de Cuellar and ask him if this is true. Obviously, you want to know. There's a story going around that you were involved in this, that you were abducted as well. And uh, he wouldn't really answer. Um, uh, we, I, and, and other people uh, found ways to, you know, uh, confront him, ambush him at airports and you know, other places and ask him point blank. And he gave, in my case, a very strange answer saying, um, uh-huh, mm-hmm, uh, well, this is not something I know about. Uh, you have to ask my wife. Well, his wife wasn't <laughs> there. So, you know, now he died. He died at 100 last year. So we'll, we'll never know wow. his, his version of the story. But... Uh, it, it was very strange. Yeah, yeah. All right, getting back to uh, you, the writing of this book. Uh, now, I know you, you mentioned that you were able to look at documents and things like that, but did you work with, um, say, relatives of John or friends of John and to get, like, inside stories of, of the man? Because I, I feel as though, you know, I, I'm getting to know, as you read through the book, you get to know, his personality, I and mean, you did a very good job at that. Thank you. Well, I did try to, I mean, I, I had the advantage of having his archives, but as, as you noted, that doesn't get you really into a full appreciation of the person. So um, luckily I had the cooperation of the family, his three sons and his wife before she died, unfortunately, of cancer. Um, so they were very helpful and they did not demand to see the manuscript beforehand. They didn't, you know, wow. uh, they didn't ask any conditions, which I thought was very uh, brave of them and really yeah. trusting to give me mm -hmm. that access without uh, demanding anything in return. So I interviewed uh, family members, including a cousin who had a, uh, who was about John's age, who had a wonderful insight into his early years, which I couldn't get anywhere else. And I looked all over for him and I found him living across the street from me in New York. Um, <laughs> and that's one of the many synchronicities uh, that, that really wowed me in, in the writing of this, in the, you know, research and writing of this book. I kept coming across these things that, uh, you know, you call Jung called synchronicities, coincidences that make no sense, but that, you know, that happen all the time. So, um, uh, and his friends and lovers, you know, uh, because John Mack's mother died when he was eight and a half months old, 
Um, he was traumatized by that. And uh, all his life, he said himself, he spent looking for this elusive mother figure and he found it in other women uh, he, he had romances with after he was married to his wife, Sally. Uh, he didn't skulk around. I mean, she knew what was going on. He, he wasn't secretive. Uh, he, didn't, um, he didn't really try to hide it. He just said, I, I'm attracted to, to women. And I think part of it was the search for, for the missing mother. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I talked to quite a number of those women. There weren't that many. I mean, there were a few. He had romances with a few women. He was not promiscuous. It wasn't like he was, you know, hitting on every woman who came his way. He was, he just fell in love with a number of women. Uh, he was a good looking guy. There you see. Um, yeah. um, so, and luckily a number of the women uh, did, uh, you know, uh, share their confidences with me and tell me the stories. Uh, and that really, I think, added a dimension because we could see, I could see John Mack through their eyes. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's a really good, a really good advantage um, to, to do it that way. Now, have you had, you mentioned that no one asked um, to look at the manuscript ahead of time. How about feedback from the family? Have you had that? Uh, luckily, very good feedback. I got a call from Danny, his uh, youngest, his uh, oldest son, firstborn. Um, recently, who said he got he had trouble going through the book at first. He was very candid. He said uh, it took him a long time to pick up the book because it was so close to him. And yeah. uh, I talk about how you know Danny was really broken up at the funeral. Um, anyway, so he didn't read it right away, which kind of surprised me. I thought he would you know tear through it and you know pick it apart or you know, but he took a long time to to read it. But when he did. He discussed it with his two brothers, and he, Danny told me they all liked it very much, uh, and um, uh, they thought it was a very fair account. I mean, it did present John Warts and all, but uh, in, in you know perspective, and um, so I was really gratified. And a lot of his friends have come forward to say they recognized the portrait, and it was good. And, and, and I guess the even better compliment uh, was that they found things in the book that they didn't know. So I added things oh. to things that even his friends didn't know. Well, I got to tell you, I there was a lot of things I didn't know about some UFO cases that you wrote about. Um, you know, for instance, uh, I had no idea the Kenneth Arnold case that you always hear about in 1947 had all those other witnesses, 20 other witnesses. I never knew that until I was reading through uh, what you wrote about that. So, um, and so there's a lot more in there for the person uh, besides John Mack. Uh, there's a lead to go into a lot of the cases. Uh, if you'll forgive me just one second, I want to pop this up. Um, this is from Lou at the uh, uh, Unidentified Celebrity Review. He is putting together this thing. It's basically um, ET phone home on on April 24th coming up. They look at uh, hashtag the big phone home and organized hmm. uh, event to call Congress and the Senate during an eight hour stream. So uh, huh? we're gonna have a we're gonna have a live stream. I'm gonna be involved in that, and that's coming up. Um, the big phone home, it's called, kind of on you know off huh. the so, ET thing. ET uh, phone home, on, right? Yeah, on the 24th of April. So uh, thanks for letting me do that little plug. Thank you, uh, Luis, for uh, for doing all that. He's been uh, really instrumental. It was his idea, and it was a great idea. So um, this, as far as Mac goes you know he 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 kind of gets into this slowly i mean he had he's very well established and he kind of gets into this slowly and then finally he 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 comes out of the closet so to speak what was that experience like for him well it was slow but it was fast too you know <laughs> because uh, after he he meets bud hopkins in december of 1990 um and he he walks away with the letters that that bud hopkins gave him from abductees or experiences telling their stories. But he doesn't read them right away because he has a trip coming up to Czechoslovakia, to Prague, uh, because the Prague Spring has taken place and they're, they're opening up, they're becoming democratic. And he went there with Dan Ellsberg, who leaked the Pentagon Papers, was a friend of his. So anyway, uh, so he doesn't read them right away, but he reads them pretty quickly after that, so within a few weeks. And um, uh, he immediately assembles this group of his own experiencers to, to you know, 
talk to them about, you know, really mine their experiences because he's a psychiatrist and he wants to really have access to their, their deepest thoughts. And, um, and then within about a year, uh, kind of amazingly, he's talking to Harvard, to a Harvard audience about what he's found. So some people yeah. thought, well, that's too soon. Uh, you, you know, considering the enormity of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the phenomenon he has, he has stumbled across, uh, he really should have spent a little more time uh, investigating it. But that was John. He was very impetuous and very enthusiastic, and he couldn't wait to, to talk about what he'd found. So he, he talks to a Harvard audience, and uh, there's predictable consternation. Uh, like, oh, my God, how could this be true? including the wife of the president of Harvard and other very distinguished faculty members. So he, he, he did get some feedback. And then not long after that, he held another meeting at Harvard, a uh, lecture, where he laid out the story in even more detail. So um, he, he didn't waste much time and he wasn't secretive about it. I mean, he, you know, he was happy to, to lay it all out, which is interesting. Other people might have been more intimidated and thought, gee, you know, I got to make sure before I come forward with this, but that, that wasn't his way. Yeah. Well, it, it's amazing. Um, you, you know, you talk about, we talked about earlier how the New York Times kind of moved the needle uh, in, in a direction. And um, as far as abductions, I don't know if it actually moved a needle, but do you think it did change how people were looking at the oh, abduction did. phenomenon? It definitely did. I mean, there were different scientists involved and, and doctors were seeing patients. So there was something going on under the surface uh, in many places uh, that didn't draw many headlines because obviously if people go to see a doctor about or a psychiatrist about an experience, it doesn't make headlines, it's, it's private. So th this work was going on, but nobody put it front and center like John Mack. And because he was willing to go on these shows, including Oprah, when his book came out, um, he really became a celebrity. So uh, that, uh, you know, put it in a spotlight. And then suddenly there were, you know, a lot of articles about it and, and a lot focused on John. So, you know, people ask, well, since he's gone, is there anyone comparable, you know, doing this research? And the answer is no, uh, you don't read about it the same way. But um, uh, w w while he was around and, and doing this research, he was everywhere. Right, right. Um, now we do have questions that pop up every now and then on chat. Also, someone uh, sent me questions earlier today. I'm going to try to get to that at some point. Uh, let's 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 answer this one uh, quickly before we go into more. Uh, this has to do with um, between. Let's see the initials M from this person. I don't know who they are. Okay. Uh, do you have any information on the connection between a tip and the Sh uh, the Sherman Ranch? Yeah, that's the Skinwalker, Skinwalker yeah, Ranch. Okay. Um, um, as far as I know, the connection is that uh, Robert Bigelow, the billionaire uh, uh, entrepreneur and space scientist, one of his modules, by the way, uh, ha Space Habitats is attached to the International Space Station. Um, uh, so Robert Bigelow has also been a funder of uh, research in anomalous events. Uh, he, he funded a poll that John Mack and Bud Hopkins took early on about uh, abduction and how, how common it was, which was quite controversial. But so Robert Bigelow has been a funder of anomalous research for a long time. Um, so when ATIP was, um, was was organized or founded in 2007 with a 22 million dollar appropriation that uh, Harry Reid got secretly uh, to set it up. Um, the the contract involved um, picked to uh, uh, to do some of the research and and commission some of the scientific papers on UFOs, etc. Was Robert Bigelow. And people have pointed to the connection between Robert Bigelow and Harry Reid. They know each other a long time. They're both from Nevada. And um, um, so it wasn't particularly surprising. So um, so the main contractor for, for, uh, for ATIP was Robert Bigelow. And he commissioned studies 
some of which we've seen on um, uh, on UFO aerodynamics and possible materials and you know whatever they could pull together on uh, understanding UFOs. Um, that's what Robert Bigelow did, but it's not really public because he's a, it was a private contractor, and um, it's it's not responsive to FOIA you know requests. So it's really kind of mysterious. Um, at the same time, you know, Robert Bigelow bought the Skinwalker Ranch, which was this uh, Utah ranch where all kinds of paranormal things were going on. Um, but as far as I know, ATIP was not really involved with that. ATIP was involved with UFOs in the skies and not strange things going on on the ground at a Utah ranch. So I, I, I hope that answers your question to some degree. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, of that, I will have uh, the new owner of uh, the Skinwalker Ranch, oh. Brand, Brandon, he'll be on um, sometime in, in May uh, on this mm. show. Uh, wow. Another question that was uh, sent to me earlier, can you describe your dealings with uh, the point lady at the Pentagon for UFOs when you were doing that article? I think Is it Susan uh, Goff or something like oh, that? God. Yeah, um, very few. First of all, um, the, 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 the uh, component of our story that involved interactions with the Pentagon was handled by my colleague, Helene Cooper, who's a, def a defense correspondent for the New York Times in Washington. So she knew the uh, spokespeople at the Defense Department. And basically, um, <clears throat> when our story was done uh, with our sources uh, you know, on the record, we went to the Defense Department for comment, and uh, they didn't say much, which again, we had kind of predicted. And then... Uh, Later on, they suggested that Lou Alessandro was not the head of the program or he wasn't what he said he was, which we, we thought was very damaging to them uh, because Lou Alessandro, we're confident, is exactly what we said he was. He was the head of the program um, and he has an intelligence background and he, everything he told us stood up. So uh, there was no question about his credibility, but there was some effort in the Defense Department early on to kind of raise doubts about uh, Lou Elizondo, uh, completely unwarranted in our view. And um, in fact, the, the, the Defense Department has now uh, done a 180 and they are now uh, becoming more forthcoming and, you know, asking people to report, asking, you know, pilots and sailors to report, uh, you know, UFO sightings. So uh, I don't think they're doing the same things they did early on with us. Was there, when you were, writing that article was there ever any point where there was like question whether this could be a disinformation situation um well it always comes up you know what these objects are and nobody knows but um i can tell you this that there was no question that we were not leaked this information we were not fed this information uh for disinformation uh, we know how we got the information through through good contacts Leslie had. Uh, we had to uh, eke it out. You know, nobody spoon fed it to us. Um, so uh, in that sense, it was not um, some plot to you know leak the story to us. We we fought for that story to get it to get it out from our sources. Um, and uh, it, it, I mean, if anyone is suggesting that these objects are secret American technology, all our experts say absolutely not. Um, it wouldn't make any sense for, uh, you know, the American military to be flying dangerously close to Navy jets, exposing its technology to, you know, to accidents. For, for so many reasons, uh, we are told absolutely authoritatively that this is not American technology. Now, if could it be foreign technology? That's a slightly different story, but also probably not. Right. And do you think what do you do you think that uh, that article also kind of helped a little bit with the um, with the government's investigation currently? That's you know their hundred and eighty day. I heard it's going to probably take a lot longer than that. But you mentioned Mark uh, Ruby, Marco Rubio and um, you know talking about that. Um, do you think that was an influence as well, part of it? Yeah, I like to think that that, that we had some role in in uh, showing the government that it's okay uh, if some of this information comes out. Uh, you know, for a long time, the government took the position that none of this information should come out. Ever since Blue, Blue Book was shut down 
1970, the government has insisted that, you know, nothing to see there, folks. Just keep, yeah. move along. <laughs> nothing to see. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Navy pilots and sailors were discouraged from reporting UFOs because they'd be sent to the shrink. Uh, they would hurt, you know, hurt their career. Commanders made an issue of it. But now uh, there's an, uh, more of a willingness. So I think we showed the government in a way that it's okay to acknowledge what everybody already knows, that these things are up there, they're flying around, nobody knows what they are, but they but they exist. That's already a big you know, step forward, that these things are real. Um, yeah. So I think it gave the government a little more confidence. Yeah, I, I hope eventually we are able to see you know, more videos. I mean, you talked about that video being one of the most viewed ever uh, you know, through the New York Times. Um, and I believe that will still happen cons considering, um, you know, I've heard Lou Elizondo say that there are more compelling videos than those uh, out there. And, you know, they show just a short period of time. Um, and, you know, I understand a lot of that could have to do with yes. national security or, or something like that. But uh, it sure would be wonderful to see more of those videos. How do you yeah. feel? Do you think that we'll be seeing them someday? I think we will see more of them. We'd love to see more. We are, you know, always looking to uh, get more on the public record. Uh, we've heard the same things, Martin, that the that there are many more videos, that they're better quality, they're longer than what we were able to put out. So, and you know, they're paid for by the American people. I mean, uh, you know, who do they belong to? Um, now, I understand the, you know, interest is keeping our secrets from adversaries, but the adversaries are grappling with the same thing for everything we hear. Yeah. Um, so uh, again, it's a question of, of how much the American people are entitled to know, and it's their money uh, that's you know paying for this uh, surveillance and, and this technology to, that that is tracking these things. So they should know what what it shows. You know, I, I wonder sometimes, like if a, if a video comes out and it's too good, are people going to just say? It, no, it is too good and it can't be real. It has to be CGI. But of course, if it has the government behind it, that was that is what will make the difference. You know, after our video came out, there were a lot of people second guessing us on the Internet, um, oh, yeah. raising doubts. And, you know, there are people who have nothing better to do. Or maybe, maybe, I mean, I don't want to disparage them. They're, they're very smart people out there and they have a lot of technical ability, but they were analyzing this stuff and showing how it couldn't be true and it had to be faked and look at this angle and that angle. And uh, none of that uh, held up as far as I know because the Navy finally came out and authenticated the, the uh, video. And they wouldn't do that if they were gonna be caught in a lie. Uh, yeah. It seems clear to me. So um, there's always gonna be people who, you know, who are gonna try to take an adversarial position and uh, there are people who, who bash the New York Times, bash me, bash us, you know, um, it's uncomfortable, but I guess it comes with the territory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mick West, I'm sure you know who that is or probably heard the name. Uh, are you familiar with who he is? Yeah. Uh, uh, I've heard. Of it. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, uh, he has done some really good work in the past, but in particular on these videos, the three videos that came out, he did absolutely terrible work. I mean, nothing was even close to uh, fitting what he was saying. And, and that that's, it was right into the debunker mode. And unfortunately, it seems like uh, a lot of people like that have a lot of followers and a lot of people are just going to dismiss that and turn their heads and walk away, you know? Well, as um, you know, the Internet is the Wild West and anybody, you know, yeah. can get on and say anything they want and portray themselves any, you know, where they, where they want as experts. There's a lot of agendas out there. Um, when we were doing our stories and not just the December 2017 story, but subsequent stories, uh, we had a lot of second guessing from, you know, people on the Internet who were saying, why didn't the New York Times report this? And they were tracking us, you know, who we were talking to and why don't they say this? And the truth is we said what we were comfortable saying. There was a lot of stuff, information that came to us that we didn't put into the paper because we couldn't authenticate it or it didn't rise to the level of proof that we and our editors demanded. So, but there were always people out there who say, ah, the New York Times is being muzzled or, you know, what else did they have that they didn't print? There's yeah. always stuff you have that you don't print. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I talked to Leslie um, not, not, not too long after that article came out and she explained, you know, what, uh, what scrutiny 
that uh, you all faced there. It was not an easy, not an easy task to get that article done. It was not, and and you know that's what editors do. And the, you know the more um, innovative your stories become, or the more probing. First of all, you're dealing in an area of classified information. Uh, uh, a lot of the you know stuff that the government has compiled is classified, so th that already uh, puts a crimp in what we're able to you know report or what we're able to find out, much less report. So people won't talk to us about it because they don't want to go to jail, and we don't want to go to jail. So um, um, so we have to work around that and work with material that is not classified. Um, and ATIP, by the way, was not a classified program. Uh, interestingly enough. Um, that is strange. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, th there's so much overclassification in the government and uh, people mm. we talk to say this all the time. <coughs> it's, um, you know, the, the instinct, I guess, of government bureaucrats, if they went in doubt, stamp it classified, you know. Um, and so much of what uh, people already know, obviously, and what's out there is, is stamp classified. It's overclassified. So uh, that's a problem. Uh, but there's legitimate stuff that's classified. We understand that. You know, we have adversaries uh, that are looking to know what we're capable of, and they want our technology. Um, so um, it's just that, 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 that some things don't need to be as classified as, as they are, we think. And w the American public deserves to know. It can be trusted, you know, can be trusted with the truth. We can handle the truth. That's right. Not like in that movie. Yeah. <laughs> like in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're going into break here in just a couple minutes. And during the break, I'm going to play a clip of uh, Dr. Mack um, at the Ariel School. Right after that happened, a, f a number of weeks, he showed up there. But uh, would you say of all the cases that he looked into, is that the most profound? Just about. Just about. Because it involved children uh, speaking to him on the record um, in, in childish ways that seem to rule out, uh, you know, premeditation or uh, hidden agendas. These were kids uh, who encountered um, a UFO landing, apparently at their school, and two uh, beings got out and um, uh, interacted with the children, gave, gave them telepathic messages, is what the students, what the pupils said later. <clears throat> the children drew pictures of what they'd seen. The, the accounts were consistent. Um, it was an absolutely amazing episode, and we can talk about that after the break in more detail. But John did go there, and he interviewed the kids, and he made uh, tapes of the kids, audio and video, um, many of which I've seen. And some of the kids' drawings are in my book. So uh, it could be the most important case he investigated. Yeah, and we're get we're going to jump in in just a minute for for that break. But um, I do want to say, again, for the new listener, as I mentioned, we have a lot of new listeners. If you just look into the Ariel School um, incident, you will see a lot about that. And and also you have a, a friend of mine in the book uh, a few times, uh, Randy Nickerson. And he's, uh, he's you know, uh, I, I believe he was on Oprah, too. Um, was. But he's, he's very reluctant to talk about his past when it comes um, to his experiences. Yeah, Randy's very uh, private, and um, yes. you know, I guess given his experiences, he has a right to be. He is in the book. He's given another name, Scott, which I talk about. So if you want to read about his experience, you just look at John Mack's book uh, on the chapter Scott, and you'll find you know an amazing uh, you know series of, of, of events. Uh, and Randy has done a film on on the aerial phenomenon. Uh, yeah, which hopefully we'll get to soon. see that soon. It's getting yeah. real close, and. Um, mm. I have heard uh, details, and I'll share them as soon as, as I'm Good. able to on this show. And we'll have him on just before. So I'll, uh, we're about ready to go into break here. And I just wanted to say for the uh, person over on YouTube, uh, watch the way that John Mack talks to these children. I mean, it just, it just, it's incredible. He gets down to their level. He's a tall man, gets down to their level, talks softly, and he doesn't lead them. And it's wonderful. This just shows uh, a testament to uh, the type of person he is. For those of you over at KGRA Radio, we'll be right back right after these messages. I'd say I'd call them aliens. I'd call them alien beings. In September 1994, over 60 children from this school in the suburbs of Harare, Zimbabwe, witnessed several objects landing and two beings coming out. 
Just over two months later, John and Dominique came to the scene to work with the children, their parents, and the teachers still suffering from shock. John, who essentially specialized in child psychiatry, devoted a great deal of time to interviewing the children. Something scared you, is that right? Is yes. It, what, what scared you? The noise. What noise? The noise that we heard in the air. You heard a noise in the yes. air? What was it like? Like a roar or a buzz or a hum or what kind of a noise? It was like someone was blowing a flute. It was scary myself. It was scary because you saw something yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saw a little object hovering. It was quite big actually and then there was little ones all around it. We saw something silver and then we quickly ran to the lout to the logs and we saw a silver, silver thing and we saw a man standing next to it. Uh, what was it, what did it feel like when he was looking at you? I felt scared. It, it felt scared? What was scary about it? Well, I felt scared because I've never seen such a person like that before. Did you see the eyes? What did they look like? They were um, going like that. Where was the pointy part? It was the pointy part in here, or was the pointy part okay. out there, up there? And what was the feeling when you looked at the eyes? Um, it was scary. Mm -hmm. And what scary? Why? What made it scary? The eyes looked evil. Evil. Mm -hmm. And what was evil about them? Mm -hmm. Say what you mean by evil. It looked evil because it was just staring at me. With what? Staring at you as if what? As if to do what? As if it wanted to come and take us. As if it wanted to come and take you. That was the feeling you got? That it wanted you to go with it? Did you feel like you wanted to go with it? No. Did you feel... What was the effect on you when, when you felt it wanted to have you go with it? Perhaps? I just um, walked away and I started crying. They came running up here in such a panic. And, I mean, even if we had staged it, they could not have run all together like that. Even if we practiced it, I don't know how many times. <laughs> that they came up here like a living snake. And they just came... We were in a staff meeting and we just heard them screaming, screaming, ah! And then they were here, you know? And a child can't make that up. <coughs> I was very skeptical in the beginning as well. Um, I believed that they'd seen something, but I wasn't prepared to accept that it was anything supernatural or anything like that. But I think the consistency of, of what's been going on indicates that it was more than I was prepared to admit in the beginning. So both of them were running. One was running um, in the trees, and the other one was run, running across the ship, because mm -hmm. there were also trees here. Mm -hmm. The eyes were, were like more pointed as they came in toward the center of the yes. head, is that? Yeah. No, more circular. And this was all black. Yeah. All black. Now it's you've made pupils. Small. Did they actually have pupils or yes, was it? Okay, Martin, coming back in three, two, one, go. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Martin Wills, your host. And uh, I just love that clip. Uh, and I, I know, hopefully, there's some people that speak German. They could read the, the subtitles on that. Sprechen Sie Deutsch. But uh, anyway, uh, so it's a great clip to see John working with these kids. And I'm sure that's how he always worked with children. You know, yeah, he, uh, uh, he did. He literally got down on the floor with kids to get to their level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, that, that case, I think I, I say this a lot in the show to me, I, that's what I say in the top five cases. And it's right up near number one, in my opinion, um, because I've had, uh, I don't know, three or four, I think four now, of the witnesses as adults on, and their stories are consistent. And, you know, I mean, I heard some of what they said, that these uh, these 
uh, witnesses have talked about. And, and it's really interesting. I can't wait for Randy's film to come out because it's really interesting how it's affected their lives. Every, you know, every single one of them, some good, some bad. And I think you mentioned in the book that, um, you know, some of the parents were looking at this as like evil spirits, that type of thing, you know? Uh, yeah. The parents, um, uh, were as, as mystified as everybody else. I tell a couple of funny stories in the book, uh, the believer, um, for example, um, when the, um, the, this, uh, ship or whatever it was object landed, um, and the kids were freaked out and they saw these two beings, uh, come out. Uh, one of the little girls ran into the sweet shop where her mother was guarding the cash register. She didn't want to go out, uh, you know, and, and leave the cash register and the candy uh, where it could be accessible to the kids. So a little girl came running in and screamed, aliens. And the mother there said, now, now, calm down. Uh, be polite. If there are aliens out there, we want them to know that we're, you know, nice and polite. So uh, they, <laughs> they were a little condescending. And they have candy. Yeah, they have candy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, one of the interesting things about that whole episode is uh, how come there were no adults there to witness this? I mean, it was just extraordinary that 60 kids were in the yard at recess and um, uh, and no adults happened to be present. So they asked John Mack that, you know, did the aliens figure out that this would be a time when no parents would be present? And his answer was, you know, I'm very bad at alien psychology. <laughs> <laughs> so they kept yeah. asking him, why do the aliens do this? Why do the aliens do that? He says, yeah. I don't know, you know, but that's, it just happened that way. Now, did they plan it that way or did it just happen? You know, again, um, but the parents, as you heard, were, you know, believed that the kids had seen something. Right. And, you know, it was a lot more than 62 because there were, there were uh, the sub-primary children, that whole group was out there too. And they, they witnessed it, but they they couldn't be interviewed because of their age. Ah, oh, interesting. I didn't even know that. But uh, that, and you know, Martin, as as you say, uh, some of the kids are now grown up. They're all grown up, but some of the kids have come forward and they're recounting their memories, indelible memories, of that day, which they still remember, and they've drawn pictures of it. I mean, it 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 it, it dominates their lives to this day. Um, yeah. I had one of the witnesses on in Madagascar. That's where he is now. And it really, uh, he's had, uh, he's done some regressive, you know, hypnotism and, and, and has worked things out and things are now in a positive way. They weren't, they were, it was really affecting him in a terrible way. And he kind of turned his life around. And, uh, and I thought, um, some of the things he said for the person that didn't get a chance to see that interview, it's on, it's on, uh, it's on this, uh, YouTube channel at some point. It's also over on, uh, Randy Nickerson's, uh, aerial school, uh, phenomenon channel as well. But he describes these things as like skipping along, you know, floating like, and, and like shooting off all of a sudden and all of a sudden it, blinking in and out of his existence and moving in different places, these beings. Right. And, you know, which the, is the accounts so yeah, are, are consistent with uh, other people's accounts. Remember uh, Ken Arnold's first account of UFOs back in yeah. 1947 were like stones skipping over the water. Um, yeah. So yeah. these same phrases keep coming up. It, it really is interesting. And this is, you know, so many years later and the, the movements that kind of um, this hovering or this bouncing movement, that witnesses have reported uh, keeps coming up again and again. Now, are they all in touch with each other? Do they agree to describe it in these certain terms, or yeah. is this something that is a that that is is a general phenomenon that everybody describes? Right, and and you you know you think of another like really great thing that happened when it comes to John Mack is if he wasn't you know I know the BBC had that reporter there and mm -hmm. and and did a good job. But we wouldn't know anything about this if John Mack didn't do those interviews. I don't think they, it, it would have made that much of an impact on us. I think you're uh, right. It would day. have been a, a local story. It would have been just another mystery. But he elevated it to uh, a higher plane because he was a psychiatrist uh, and because he, you know, where he went made news. 
you know, I want to say something else that I think is important to uh, to clear up, that um, these encounters were not only traumatic, as John Mack saw them, they carried with them a transformative element. And he was basically alone in seeing this or, or propounding this, that um, uh, the people who, who came to him with stories of, you know, reproductive procedures on the ships, they were certainly traumatic uh, and terrible, uh, frightening experiences to be helpless in the face of these beings. But many of them also said, talking to John Mack afterwards, that they felt um, some kind of connection to the beings, that they got a message or they got messages to take better care of the planet, uh, yeah. that the earth is endangered and they had to do something about it. Uh, that some of them remembered seeing images on the ships of apocalyptic destruction, like warnings that this, this could happen to the planet. So there was that positive aspect that almost he almost alone he saw, and Bud Hopkins and Dave Jacobs, the other member of their research uh, triumvirate, um, didn't really uh, give much credit to. Bud Hopkins and particularly Dave Jacobs thought that uh, the alien experience was almost you know, uniformly negative, that it was traumatic, it was real, it was happening in real time, it was not you know, some subtle phenomenon, and um, that the aliens were trying to take our DNA for a hybrid race or some, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, awful scenario. But John saw it as, as something else, that and something else. Yes. Didn't, was it John who said, or someone in your book said that um, it's possible that they were shown these images or got these messages to see a reaction? I remember something yeah, I like think, that in your book. I think that was Bud Hopkins. Uh, oh, Bud. I, I forgot. I think it was Bud Hopkins' uh, th th hypothesis that perhaps um, uh, they were testing humans just to see. I mean, there's a lot of speculation that uh, the procedures on the yeah. ships and so were in order to um, understand how human beings operated, including the sexual part. Uh, there are a lot of stories of aliens watching uh, sexual intercourse. Uh, sometimes by abductees who knew each other. They were abducted together and were sort of forced to, to you know, make love as the aliens watched, which was very uncomfortable for them, as they said later. And then, uh, you know, other people said, well, why the aliens keep coming back to the same procedure? It, it, reproduction is not that complicated. You can get a hygiene manual. <laughs> um, so they must be very bad scientists if they have to see this again and again and again. Um, and then, so we have to go back to John Mack's statement again. Well, I'm not an alien psychologist. I don't know why they do these things. We don't even know if they exist. But if they exist, we don't know why they do the same things over and over again. Um, yeah. It's just part of the mystery. Right, right, yeah. Um, a thing I say a, a lot is like a lot of times we will project what our way of thinking is into the way of whatever it is that's coming here, which makes no sense because we have absolutely no idea right. And uh, in that. You know, there was a, a um, uh, this just brings something else to mind. There was a conference at MIT in 1992 that I write about in my yeah. book that yeah. John Mack attended and brought together atomic physicists and folklorists and theologians and psychiatrists, uh, some of the best scientific minds of the day, trying to figure out what this abduction phenomenon amounted to. And one of the papers dealt with the experiments um, on, on the ships and, and women particularly told about instruments that penetrated them and implanted them with implants or removed their eggs and, and all that. And um, a, a very astute um, doctor who, who gave a paper at the conference said that the medical procedures on the ships were completely different than normal earth, earthbound medical experiments. Uh, so it's not just a question of people remembering a traumatic visit to a doctor's office. Um, they were very different procedures. The aliens would take out someone's eye and put it back in. They would take out organs. They would open up the chest. But they were not interested in other things that human doctors are interested in, the lymph nodes and things like that. So um, it was a very one of the most interesting papers that came out of that conference, and it's collected in a book, a transcript of the conference. But it shows how uh, the, the experiences on the ships as related by the people, I mean, I don't know if they're real, but this is what the people said, were really very 
different from earthbound medical procedures. And um, it's, it's really part of the mystery, but it's a fascinating part. Right. Um, if you don't mind, can you go a little more into the MIT uh, conference that happened? I think that's yeah. fascinating. That, that is really uh, interesting. I start the book actually with the MIT conference because it, it blew my mind that there would be a conference like this at MIT. Now, MIT did not sponsor the conference. Uh, it was just, it, it uh, provided a venue uh, for the conference because it would, as, as the organizer, atomic physicist at MIT pointed out, it would have looked very bad for MIT to censor the conference and say, no, you can't use any of our space. So they provided a, a hall and, uh, and it was privately sponsored by this atomic physicist named Dave Pritchard and Mac co-sponsored and they recruited all these other people to come. And for a week, uh, they gave papers and, and debated this. Now it was secret at the time. Um, they had a number of journalists there, including CDB Bryan, who wrote a book about it, Close Encounters of the Fourth Kind, a very good book about the conference, uh, which came out later. Everybody was sworn to secrecy at the, at the time. And they also produced a transcript of the proceedings called Alien Discussions, and it's on the shelf behind me. Uh, it's a treasured part of my collection because it is uh, the most learned um, examination I could find, practically, of uh, the whole phenomenon. You know, top scientists discussing these things uh, and examining it from every which way. Folklorists saying, well, you know, in ancient literature, there were uh, other accounts of um, chariots in the sky and the Bible and Chinese, uh, um, uh, Irish fairy stories. I mean, you name it. They had uh, people looking at it from every possible uh, angle. Um, and that's what bothers me about the so-called skeptics and debunkers who pronounce that this is crazy, this couldn't be, people are nuts, uh, uh, they're, they're deluded, uh, they're making it up, it's a fa fabricating, it's a hoax, but they haven't done the homework. And the homework is in these uh, transcripts uh, that show people really trying to figure out what's going on. Something real is going on on some level um, that deserves examination. I, I agree. And, you know, I think in the beginning part of the, the book, it talks, you talk about um, the sleep paralysis phenomenon and how over the years, um, you know, people have imagined things and how, you know, that was like looked on, looked upon. But then again, a lot of people, you know, to argue that point as being everything, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are awake when these abduction situations happen and in, in daylight and all that. But I mean, um, you know, I hate using the term, but they, they said that what the old hag syndrome yeah. or something they, that people yeah. swore they saw someone over them that was trying to smother them. It's yeah, pretty, this, pretty uh, scary. Uh, you know, what, what John Mack realized uh, later in his career was that there was a whole syndrome of paranormal experiences that really were different from alien abduction. Um, but that were similarly mysterious. And one of them was this old hag syndrome um, that a, uh, a um, psychologist named David Hufford investigated. And I have his book and I talk about him early, early in my book where um, particularly in Newfoundland, uh, there were stories of people during the night being aware of some kind of an evil spirit uh, uh, climbing on their bed and, and, and uh, pressing on their chest and choking them. And they reeked of evil. I mean, a very visceral reaction. And it happened to David Hufford. I mean, the guy writing the book talks about it, it happened to him as a college student, um, the same thing. He, he distinctly remembered some, some footsteps padding into his, his college dorm room, this, uh, some creature leaning on his chest strangling him, killing him, choking him. And uh, he was paralyzed, he couldn't move. Um, and um, anyway, it's just another example of these uh, strange experiences that, that cannot be explained away. Um, and um, uh, as I said, John Mack later in his career realized that there's a whole broader area of things like uh, crop circles and, you know, near death experiences and Bigfoot and, you know, all kinds of things that that seem outside the realm of everyday life. And yet people keep coming up with these stories. Yeah. Um, 
And it's awful hard to, you know, I mean, I've, I've, uh, a lot of times I've been on the fence in the past about abduction cases and, and I still go kind of back and forth on the whole situation. It, it is a really hard pill to swallow, you know, how the, the fact that, you know, I do believe that people are experiencing something. I'm just not really sure what it is, but, uh, you know, I mean, to me, I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, if I had something like that going on in my life, I don't know how I could function otherwise, you know, do anything else, you know. Well, it just seems like such a heavy had thing. Been very traumatized. A lot of them saw psychiatrists before John Mack. Um, and they, they told, you know, they said that uh, other psychiatrists who were not particularly sympathetic, uh, prescribed drugs, uh, said that they were suffering nightmares. And when John Mack came along, he said, no, they're not nightmares because I know what nightmares are. And nightmares don't have the immediacy of these stories. These people recounting their experiences would cry and scream and weep and curse. I mean, it was very real to them. And Mack said, I know what, you know, affect, the, the scientific term, looks like for these these reactions. And they were genuine. They were not put on and they were not, you know, uh, feigned. Um, so, um um, uh, but the, the but these people had real traumas in their lives, and they were shell shocked. And many of them didn't even want to come forward. Uh, they would, you know, make up ways to contact Mac through, you know, mail drops and things like that. Right, right. What would you say was uh, when you were doing this book? And I know you discovered a lot of new things. Was there something that just stands out to you? the most of something you found out about John Mack? Um, well, I was very struck with his personal story. Um, how, uh, you know, um, he was eight and a half months old when his mother died of appendicitis. Mm -hmm. And um, penicillin had just been invented. It was uh, 1930, uh, but not in popular use yet. And uh, that trauma, uh, which he came back to again and again, uh, really shaped his life. And uh, when he was going through the holotropic breathing uh, that elevated him to altered states of consciousness, he, he imagined himself back in the womb, which is common actually in these breathing uh, procedures. Um, people go back to their earliest memories, you know, even back to before they were born. So he remembered himself in the womb and, and being pushed out of the birth canal and his mother turning blue as she struggled. And he, uh, he, he wrote about this in his journals, which I had access to. Um, and it was a very clear, uh, uh, if you call it a memory to him, uh, he, he somehow was able to go back and recreate this. Um, I found that, you know, really extraordinary. And that, of course, as I said, uh, informed his later um, search for the, the missing in, in, the, in the universe. And uh, actually, uh, early in the book, I tell this story, which I found fascinating, where he himself was hypnotized by a Brazilian uh, uh, psychologist and a hypnotist. And he's, he's going through, uh, he, you know, remembering or, or uh, reciting all these stories. He's flying through space. And then he says to her, wait a minute, I just got an amazing insight. Can I tell you? In other words, can I wake up enough to, you know, out of the trance to, to tell you? And she says, yes, go on. And he says, I just realized why I'm so interested in uh, alien life in the universe because um, – I had this trauma as a child and I was missing my mother and I've always been looking for, for life in the universe that that would make me feel less alone. I mean, he said that sort of breaking his trance to say that. So he wow. provided that key to the story himself. Um, and I found that very revealing. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. What was it like reading? I mean, I, I I'm in, I, I'm lucky enough to be one of these people. I get to read a lot of, uh, early papers and, you know, handwritings from like George Washington and really special people. Um, what was it like to hold his journal and, and actually read his writings? I mean, he was a big journaler. He journaled yeah. a lot. Uh, he was. First of all, his, his handwriting was sometimes difficult to to uh, <laughs> fathom uh, because he, like all doctors, <laughs> he would scribble. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, after a while, I got used to his scribbles and I could sort of figure out when he did this, it meant this. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of voyeuristic and, and made me a little uncomfortable um, because um, I, as, as his son Danny said to me, you know, uh, I think if he were around, he might not have liked uh, your use, he said to me, your, Ralph, your use of his um, analysis tapes, for example. Um, and that's probably true if he'd been around to ask, if I'd said, John, do you mind if I listen to your analysis tapes? He might very well have said, yeah, I mind. Uh, that's very private. Uh, um, so wow. he couldn't object, which is, you know, sad in a way. And it was yeah. helpful to me as a biographer, but I felt voyeuristic. Um, there were some things I came across in his journals that uh, really was very raw. He talked about his romances, his wife, Sally, uh, his feelings. And uh, I didn't put everything I found in the journals in the book. I thought it was not fair to him. Um, I, I gave enough of it to give people a sample so there'd be nothing totally, uh, I mean, I didn't withhold anything that was totally different that would have put a different slant on something. But there were some details that were just unpleasant and, um, he talked about his drug taking. He, he, he took LSD. He was an, ex yeah. an experimenter, an adventurer. A couple he wanted of times, to know what yeah. it was like. Yeah. And he tried ayahuasca, that vomitacious yeah. uh, South American drink with, that, you know, makes you throw up and gives you hallucinations. He did that. Um, so he, it was courageous in a way to, to subject himself to that. I wouldn't do it, but, but he did it. Right. Right. Um, we have a question up here and I'm going to put it um, up on the screen, but also want to let everyone know that uh, after we get done with this uh, question and move on, uh, we are going to open up the phone lines and I'll put that number up in just a minute. So Richard wanted to know, could you discuss the different views that Mac, Hopkins, and Jacobs had about the motivations of the ETs? Uh, yeah, I alluded to this earlier, but it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Jacobs and Hopkins were more together on this, uh, believing that the, first of all, that the abductions were, were occurring in a recognizable reality. They were not subtle. Uh, they were real and they were physical. Um, so that was one difference. John Mack increasingly began, thought that they were happening in some twilight zone that uh, really involved a penetration of our reality. Um, by some means unknown, uh, some inter interdimensionality or something. So that's one thing. The reality of the abductions was a difference. Another difference was um, uh, Jacobs, uh, Jacobs, Jacobs particularly, but Hopkins also believed that the um, uh, alien beings were out to take our DNA, create a hybrid race. Um, they didn't they were not immoral uh, uh, in that they, they didn't deliberately set out to traumatize humans, but what they did traumatize humans, they didn't care much. Uh, so they were amoral maybe. Um, and, uh, and evil, essentially evil uh, from the standpoint of the people abducted. John Mack, as I said, felt that there was also, that they were, the experiences were undeniably traumatic, but that there was a transformative element to them and and the and the messages that the aliens would leave uh, through telepathy. People said, "John, gosh, they spoke English." Well, they communicated telepathically, according to the experiencers. They got the messages in their head. The messages were that they have to take better care of the planet, uh, not eat, you know, not eat animals, not destroy the planet, not poison the planet. Um, and the people came away with a, a sort of a, a love. Some of them actually loved. Uh, and the alien beings, they had almost like love affairs with um, uh, some of the, the beings that they encountered and uh, felt that there was a bond. And, and they were also bonding, the humans felt, with, uh, with a deity, with a source of all creation, a light. Uh, so they, they would become almost religious about it. Um, and you didn't hear much of that from Hopkins and Jacobs. Yeah, I think that's kind of a fascinating uh uh, way to put it. And I, I listened to, uh, there were the four uh, people that were involved in the Allagash abduction. And one of them was the tw the twins, Jim and Jack. Um, and uh, I've Wiener, talked Wiener, to, yeah. Wiener, yeah, I've talked to Jack uh, uh, in person, but Jim, I never have. 
And I listened to an interview with Jim and, and he felt like he had another experience. And then um, the message, this is, it was a profound message uh, that he got out of the whole thing was that uh, you mentioned the word love. Uh, love was something carried across the universe, which I thought was very hopeful, if you ask me. Um, yeah, and I, I, I say that in my book, too, that John Mack believed in a benign uh, cosmic uh, intelligence and, and cosmic love. Yeah, that's fascinating. So the line is open, and that number is 855-472-5483. And uh, Bill is standing by. Uh, we have someone right now on the line. I'll bring that in in just a sec right here. Okay. We have uh, Charlie Johnson from New Hampshire. Charlie, how are you? Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm Hi. Uh, we're not too far away as the crow flies. I'm over in Massachusetts. So <laughs> uh, welcome. You have a, a question for our guest tonight? Uh, yes, uh, actually, uh, I wanted Ralph to know that uh, uh, I had seen a UFO in 1965, the, the same, uh, I think, the same one that was part of the incident in Exeter. Huh. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, yeah you um, mentioned that in your book, too, Ralph. I do. Yeah. Go ahead, Charlie. It's a... Uh, oh, well... Um, I teach at uh, Phillips Exeter Academy. I teach saxophone, and uh, Ralph, <clears throat> Ralph and I. I know you, Charlie. I know you, Charlie. <laughs> right. So, um, the the uh, but I never mentioned this to you. Um, right. I was about oh eighteen years or old or so, and staying at my grandmother's house in Lee, New Hampshire, and and I woke up in the middle of the night, uh, you know, and walked to the window. I don't know why. I mean, it just, I don't, would not normally do that. And as I looked up, I saw this large object overhead with blinking red lights. And um, my father was in the military and was in uh, lighter than aircraft. And I thought for a moment that I might be looking at a blimp. But then I realized two things. One, it wasn't making any sound. And two, uh, there weren't any blimps stationed up at Pease Air Base at that time. So there's no reason that would be this large object floating around and blinking red lights. And then, you know, I just went back to bed. I didn't think much about it. It was, it was rather strange, but um, it floated off and I, I let it go. And then I didn't really think about it until years later when I heard about the incident in Exeter and which occurred right around the same time in Kensington and, and uh, you know, I right. uh, started thinking maybe it was the same thing. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, th th that raises the question of whether you had any missing time. I mean, you said you went to bed, um, but in many of these cases, people see a UFO like that, and then they don't remember anything else, and then they wake up later somewhere else or with their pajamas put on backwards <laughs> or upside down in bed and uh, or with muddy feet, and they realize, uh, especially when they talk to someone like John Mack, that uh, something happened in between the time they saw the UFO and, uh, you know, they, uh, they woke up again. So um, are you sure, Charlie, that you didn't have any missing time? As far as I know, um, I mean, it was, it was rather strange uh, psychologically because I, I, I didn't think much of it at the time. You know, when I saw it, uh, it was just kind of like something – there and I didn't really have an explanation for it. Uh, I probably mentioned it to people at the time, but nobody, you know, really took it seriously. So uh, it, it didn't make any sense to me until years later when I read about the incident in Exeter. Then it started to occur to me that that's might might have been what I saw. Right, that's intriguing. I mean, that is one of the best documented cases around. It, it was right around the time of the Betty and Barney Hill abduction case, which is the, um, you know, the mother load of all abduction cases. Um, so uh, you, you might have seen the same thing. That's anyway, you can hear that. And Thank you. During the program. Okay. Thank you. All right. Here. Thanks so much, Charlie, for calling in. All right. Next, we have Luis from California. How are you, Luis? 
Hey, Martin. Killer show as always. Uh, thanks for shouting out the big phone home. I truly appreciate it. Um, yeah, that's you, awesome. I can't wait. Yeah. I can't wait to have you on. <laughs> um, which, by the way, Ralph, if you have an open invitation, if you'd like to come join us and talk some uh, UAP disclosure and activism efforts, you're more than welcome to, sir. Uh, my question to you was, uh, my question was, in the second season of Unidentified, I'm not sure if you've seen this or not, there was a psychiatrist, I, I was looking for her name, but I could not find her, um, and she had, I guess, sort of a differing opinion from uh, what Dr. John Mack was doing, and I wanted to know, first of all, if you had seen that. If you hadn't, that's okay. My, my, my other question would be, what is the best argument for maybe John Mack's work wasn't um, up to snuff? Is there an argument? Have you seen a counter argument that uh, that maybe questions his work or or maybe he was off? I, I mean, I don't mean to, I don't know. I'm, I can't question a Harvard you know psychiatrist, but I'm just curious, you know, because I always like to look at the other side of things and see if you know maybe there's a a, a more rational explanation. Um, and right. I think they've talked about that in season two, so I want to get your opinion. Yeah, great question. Terrific question. Uh, you might be referring to Susan Clancy. I, I, I did see Unidentified. I'm trying to remember back to that season. Uh, she wrote a book uh, basically um, describing these experiences as some aspect of sleep paralysis, as I remember. I have her book, um, and Harvard was very happy to cite her work as uh, counter- uh, countering, you know, Max. Um, so, um, if, if he had a flaw, I think it was uh, jumping too quickly to uh, uh, publicize his research. Uh, he, he really didn't get a good chance to peer review it. He tried, but it was rejected by um, uh, prestigious magazines, uh, to, uh, journals, psychiatric journals. I describe that in the book. Um, so it was not subject to uh, rigorous peer analysis. And, um, and he was uh, kind of quick to uh, announce his conclusions uh, publicly at Harvard. Um, but um, I, I am not aware of anybody who has a better explanation or an explanation to solve this mystery uh, and, and basically um, negate what Mac found. And let me go over those things very quickly. Mac found that, first of all, the people were not mentally ill, okay? It was not a construct of, of insanity. Um, they were not um, uh, deliberately faking. Uh, they were not out for publicity. On the contrary, they were shying away from publicity. Uh, he found it, it, the stories were generally consistent, um, but that they differed among uh, each other with little details so they could not be the same story circulating. He found that it affected young children who were too young to make up a story like you saw at the Ariel School. Um, those, those kids are, are quite credible in, in, in the way they describe what they saw and the similar accounts um, and you know, quite straightforward. Um, in some cases, there were um, scars on the bodies of people who said that, remembered they had been abducted and was subject to some medical procedures, scars that they didn't remember having before. Again, it's very difficult to prove that they couldn't have had these scars, but uh, one person Mac interviewed was a quadriplegic who could not have inflicted uh, scars upon himself. Um, and lastly, uh, outside their houses, uh, sometimes there was evidence of um, a UFO landing. The grass was pressed down. It wouldn't grow right, uh, you know, uh, in the spring. Um, and and lastly, I should have mentioned this as another uh, um, factor in his conclusions. Uh, sometimes there were other witnesses. As I said, the, the parents who came down and found the kids not in their beds, and then they showed up afterwards. Um, occasionally, there were uh, corroborating accounts from other people, not often. So all these things, Max said, if someone can describe a hypothesis that takes account of all these things, he says, I'm willing to buy it. But as far as I know, no one has. Very interesting. All right. Well, uh, I, I appreciate the explanation and, uh, and thank you for letting me ask the question. Appreciate it, guys. My all pleasure. right. Luis, good to talk to you. I'll talk to you soon. All right. We have a, another guest 
and that is uh, Kevin. Kevin is a actually a very good supporter of the show. Uh, I want to thank you for that, Kevin. And uh, welcome to the show, Kevin. You there, Kevin? Uh, I'm not hearing anything. Do you hear anything there, uh, Kevin? Uh, hey, Martin, yeah. Hey, uh, hey. Thanks for. I, I had a problem with my phone switching over. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a privilege to talk to both you gentlemen. My question is um, uh, this. So before I realized that ufology was really had a dovetail to what my experiences were, I was really deep into the whole Jungian thing with the aspects of the subconscious and everything. And I had experience with abduction, but I, I didn't have abduction of my body. Wasn't what I sense. It was a like an abduction of the mind, right? That I was presented with something that was supposed to look like abduction hmm. and that, uh, when I was lucid with it, I could kind of challenge it and go through several iterations of almost like it was mechanical about what it was trying to show me or what it was trying to do. Do you have much experience with uh, people who, who, who say, look, I realize I, I, I was abducted, but I wasn't physically abducted. Hmm. I'll tell you a story. Uh, and that's a good question. Uh, uh, first of all, there are many things uh, that come up that do not fit the core abduction narrative, which is interesting. So it's not just one experience repeated uh, the same, you know, every time. There are things that don't fit. And there are people who've looked into this who say that's the key almost to this whole thing are the things that don't fit, which shows that it's more unruly a phenomenon than anyone can imagine. So one of the cases uh, that came up at the MIT conference, actually, that's in my book, uh, and it's really a most fascinating case, um, it's a woman who fainted on the street uh, into the arms of her husband. And when she fainted, uh, she uh, remembered uh, or felt her mind traveling up into space and encountering these, uh, having these experiences, almost like an abduction experience, but her body remained in the arms of her husband. Um, so that sort of describes uh, what, what you are describing to me in the sense that the mind traveled, but the body stayed put. Um, so that's another you know, aspect of this that suggests that um, it, it could affect the mind and not the body. So it's not necessarily a physical abduction that the person is gone. And actually that's one of the, it was blended. It was blended. 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 I mean, that was blended. So, so I definitely had never left my bed, but there was, of course you get into the whole, you know, sexual side and everything like that. And that was the explanation that I challenged them on. And they had to go through a lot of explaining to me and they showed me three or four different iterations to try and get me to calm down to, to let them go. But, but there was, and then when I woke the next day, there was physical evidence that, Hey, wait a minute, this had actually something was going on. Right. I don't know if it's dimensions or whatever, but it's very odd. Well, a testimony like yours is exactly what uh, John, what intrigued John Mack, is that here you are describing an experience that was absolutely real to you. You can describe it very well. Um, and yet uh, proof obviously is, is absent, lacking, because these things never uh, provided the kind of absolute proof. There was never any photographic evidence that um, anybody could come up with, unlike with UFOs, uh, alien materializations or whatever they are don't come out on photographs uh the cameras malfunction or they don't show anything um uh, randy nickerson encountered this when he set up cameras with trip wires so uh so that's the problem your anecdotal account is very is very persuasive but uh there's no way to back it up my story yeah you're right it's just my story and and it went through uh it went through looking like a gray to looking like a uh, an elf, to looking like several different things before it ended up looking like a bug, right? Oh. I mean, just all over the place, just showing me whatever it could to calm me down. 
for whatever it, it needed to accomplish. Yeah. Anyway, it's fascinating. Uh, fascinating. In a way, this kind of reminds me a little bit of, of when people are talking about their NADs, NEDs, the near-death experiences. Right. You um, know, um, yeah. kind of hovering well, that, above the, the body yeah. or whatever. Yeah. That's right. And often they can describe the conversation. Uh, well, you know, Leslie Kane just had this six-part um, Netflix right. series based on her book, yeah. Surviving Death. And among the accounts where people would be dead on the table, uh, doctors would be working over them to resuscitate them, and they would feel themselves flying up to the ceiling, looking down, and afterwards they could reproduce the conversations of all the doctors. And the doctors were dumbfounded and said, there's no way this person could have heard this. Uh, even people in far corners of the room were talking, and this person, when they came back, recounted the whole thing. I mean, it's astounding. Right, right. I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time, uh, Martin and Sydney, trying to develop the lucid dreaming experience, right? Being able to get into that and keep it on that edge so you can stay aware. And that's where this sort of is a just an offspring of that. So anyway, thank you very much for taking my question. All right. Thank you for the call. Um, so the line is still open. That number is 855-472-5483. And along, and along those lines, uh, Ralph, did – did John Mack ever explore anything else, you know, before I know he was doing this up to the point where he, he, uh, you know, had the accident and died, but did he explore other unusual topics? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what didn't he explore? <laughs> um, uh, first, first of all, uh, shortly before he died, he got very interested in crop circles and he went on a trip to, uh, no to England to, to lie in them and to feel the energy. And he got very enthusiastic about that, just like he got enthusiastic about uh, alien abduction. And he, I feel the power and he, you know, he, he really got something from it. He said, no way these could be man-made. Uh, he was very enthusiastic about that. Um, wow. He, uh, yeah, uh, he had a little ritual before some of his meetings where they would uh, throw uh, runes, Viking runes, stones, to, to foretell the future. They'd reach into a bag, pull out a, a stone. This goes back to, you know, ancient Germanic ritual, you know, around uh, uh, early uh, early centuries after, you know, BC, AD. Um, people would pull a rune out of a bag and, and then they would consult a book and the rune, the meaning of the rune would come clear. And one of the, one of the runes seemed to have foretold John's death where he picked a blank rune. So he uh -oh. was into that. Uh -oh. Yeah. Uh, he was into, uh, I mean, uh, and, and, and most famously, he was into, uh, uh, you know, uh, after death, after life experiences. He was trying to do a book on a young woman who died, Elizabeth Targ, the daughter of Russell Targ, the great uh, remote viewing pioneer. Uh, her, his daughter was also a great genius and a, a, a interested in paranormal uh, events and she died of brain cancer and afterwards uh, uh, there were stories of her spirit coming back and being seen by people and John was very taken with that. He knew Elizabeth and was entranced by her story and he was preparing a book um, about it uh, when he himself was killed. So, um, so he was involved, you know, if there was, an, if there was a weird experience somewhere, he was on it. He wanted to know uh, what, what, what it was all about. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's great that he was that open-minded and uh, you know, when you're tenured, you, you do have a lot of free will wheeling, but let's <laughs> talk about that. You know, he was investigated and how far that went and, and how close was he to getting uh, pushed out? Well, pretty close. Uh, what happened is, uh, you know, he kept thinking, I better tell my Harvard superiors about the work I'm doing. Um, so uh, he finally uh, decided he was going to have a meeting with his, uh, uh, you know, the head of the medical school. And when he showed up, uh, the guy handed him a letter saying that the, the Harvard Medical School had already decided to um, convene a committee to investigate him. And as I said, they called, they said, this is not an inquisition, John. So immediately he thought, well, if it's not an inquisition, why are they using the word inquisition? But it was secret. Uh, it was an effort to, you know, um, 
discredit him uh, or understand his uh, his methods uh, to you know uh, understand why he was so enthusiastic uh, with his um, you know with his uh, patients or subjects. They never could they never could figure out whether they were research subjects or patients. But anyway, um, so they subjected him to a long ordeal uh, over a year where they. Uh, questioned him and they questioned his experiencers and they read his books and they tried to see if his, um, if he was billing improperly, uh, which he was not. Um, if he was validating people by saying, you know, you're having an abduction experience, even, you know, uh, in other words, was he implanting the idea in them, which he wasn't. Um, uh, so they investigated him from every particular standpoint. He had, Crackerjack lawyers, by the way. One one lawyer was Eric McLeish, who had um, uh, outed the priest abuse scandal in Boston in the movie Spotlight. He's, he's a character. Another was Danny Sheehan, who had uh, um, investigated the Ku Klux Klan and the Reagan uh, Iran Contra arms scandal um, and the Karen Silkwood affair. Um, and his lawyers were they really held uh, Harvard's feet to the fire. And in the end, Harvard said, you know. Uh, we can't find any fault with his, you know, his methods. Uh, he shouldn't be so enthusiastic. Or you, John, shouldn't be so enthusiastic. And he agreed. Yeah, I was a little too enthusiastic. Uh, don't do it again. Okay, I won't. Um, <laughs> and that was it. But it yeah. cost him hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal expenses. It dragged right. him through the ringer, and it was a terrible experience. Do you think that was also like the ending of his marriage too, that part of it? No, I think the marriage was, uh, uh, first of all, he, he was so obsessed with his work that his, his marriage suffered. Um, Sally had basically had it with his romances, uh, which, as I said, John made no big secret of. Uh, he was not the kind of guy to skulk around, you know, cheating. But his, uh, Sally knew pretty quickly when he was enamored of a new uh, person. There were only two or three people, you know, like that, but they were intense when they when they, you know, happened. Um, so that's what ended the marriage. Um, mm -hmm. But she was a good supporter of him to the end. And she, uh, she realized he was, he was a genius and, uh, and she loved him throughout. So I tell that story in the book, it was really painful to see uh, how she struggled with her, uh, her faith in him and how he tested her again and again, but he was devoted to her too. They had a strange, um, you know, like all couples, a very unusual dynamic. Yeah, some do. Yes. Uh, there's a clip. I'm sure you've seen it many times, probably, where uh, Dershowitz uh, says something along the lines. I'm paraphrasing here. But um, if it was God or, you know, some spirit in the sky that we we never have any evidence for. Fine. But when it comes to aliens, forget it. You know, yeah, you know well, what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah. I, I think I do. I know uh, Alan Dershowitz famously came to John Mack's defense um, yeah. during the Harvard uh, inquiry, and he wrote an uh, op-ed piece basically saying that Harvard um, it can be seen as, as challenging his uh, academic freedom, even though Harvard kept saying it's not challenging his academic freedom. Um, it looked that way. So... Um, uh, Dershowitz came to his defense, which is interesting. Also, I should mention this, that Harvard is no stranger or was no stranger at the time to uh, strange research. Um, uh, William James, the, you know, the great father of psychology, was at Harvard when he was experimenting with mediums and seances. So uh, Harvard certainly had reason to um, accept a strange research, uh, you know, from its faculty. So there was something... Uh, so that would have been reason enough to, you know, allow John Mack, you know, the freedom to pursue his, his inquiries. But there was something about his enthusiasm that, that put them off. Isn't that something? Well, you know, a lot of, of what he was looking at is, you know, uh, whether these people were, you know, suffered some other ailment, you know, mental illness of some kind. And, you know, when he found out they didn't, that, you know, I, I can understand enthusiasm after, you know, finding that out? Yeah, I mean, he looked into all the things, you know, people said, oh, these are like rape victims, you know, they suffered, maybe they are concealing a, a family history of incest. 
Um, right. So when 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 Mac looked into their histories, he found they were very normal. In that, yes, there was there was in some cases they had incest. In some cases, there were alcoholics in the family. There were all kinds of traumas in the family because they were normal people. What family right. doesn't have some you know trauma? But he said the traumas didn't cause them uh, to to have these uh, encounters or memories or encounters with with alien beings. That was not the explanation for them. Um, uh, they would. They they often uh, had. Uh, uh, I don't want to say mental illnesses, but they had mental disturbances as a result of what they encountered. Not they didn't have the encounters because they were mentally ill. Right. You know, one of the things that have always fascinated me. I know you touched on it, and that is uh, when it comes to generational. You know, I mean, that's another strange thing. When, yeah. You know, a child and then a mother and then, uh, you know, they're yeah. all uh, suffering these. We, we only have a couple minutes left here. Just letting you know. Uh, yeah. That, that, I mean, that was something that John noticed, uh, interestingly enough, that it ran in families, that uh, if someone had an abduction story, chances are his mother or father and grandfather and grandmother had it too. And chances are the children would have it. Uh, why? Uh, we don't know. Are these families tracked? Are there implants put in? None of the implants, as far as I know, were really conclusive that people came up with afterwards and they would find, you know, things coming out of their body, little BBs and things like that. And they say these are implants. But uh, again, proof was very, it wasn't that easy. You couldn't take something out of someone's body and say, aha, an alien implant. This proves that they were tracked. Uh, it didn't work that way. Sometimes the objects seem to be biological as if they were, you know, came from the person's body itself. Um, or sometimes the object was lost, you know, by, in the testing. Uh, but there was always a story. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Now, uh, we're about ready to go, but I wanted to ask you, and, and I know um, I was a little bit of a, not a, well, I guess I, I contacted you quite a bit uh, last year when I heard there was an article coming out. There was all kinds of rumors, and you and I talked you know, offline, basically, I mean, online, basically, on on how uh, people were kind of making that very difficult for you to move forward with your stories. But uh, did you have, uh, how did that story in particular, it wasn't the bombshell that, you know, the December 2017 story was, but it was pretty interesting. Any no, aftermath a, of that? You're talking about the last story we did, which was on yeah, briefings. Last uh, summer. Briefings to, con uh, briefings, uh, uh, to uh, uh, congressional committee staff about supposed materials right. that were recovered by the government were being tested. And this is the most difficult story we uh, we had come up with until up to that point because a lot of it is classified um, and it was very hard to get. What we did find out was that um, um, people like Eric Davis and Hal Putoff had briefed congressional um committee staff um, mentioning materials, mentioning, they, they showed slides that, that mentioned, um, referenced materials from possible crashes. That's all we were able to say, that congressional staff was briefed. We don't know what the contents of the briefings were. That was classified. Uh, there were people yeah. out there who were dying to have us say that I you know, know. Uh, we have materials or this and that. We could yeah. not go beyond what, what the information was. So yeah. uh, the, what the situation I described to you was that people are driving us crazy by predicting in the, uh, you know, all over the internet, the Times is gonna break the story of the century. We had to stick with what we could prove and what we knew and it was very limited. And um, uh, you know, we didn't fight with our editors. Our editors wanted us to back it up. We knew it had to be backed up. We did it to the best we could. The story wasn't as long as some people expected or, you know, fantasized, but it was a good story. Um, and yeah. it was the best we could do. Excellent. Thanks so much, Ralph. It was a, a pleasure as always to speak to you tonight. Well, Martin, a pleasure to connect with you and your audience. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too. All right. Everyone will be back next week with Stan Gordon. We'll see you then. Remember to keep your eyes to the sky.